Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Put that back so I can see it. Uh, thank you very much indeed, and it's a pleasure and honor to be here in the, at this uh, festival. My research is definitely applied. Uh, the scars on my back show it. Uh, what I wanted to, and it's also a delight to be in such nicely named buildings as a scientist. You could find your way around easily. The, what I wanted to talk about was not energy so much, but the interaction of uh, companies in different countries and regimes and their role in development and contribution to development, particularly the resource industries, oil and gas and mining, in which I've spent most of my life. There is a great literature on the so-called resource curse, the impact of, of floods of money from resource revenue hitting unprepared economies and the negative consequences of that. Overvalued exchange rates squeezing out of other parts of the, the economy and, and so on. The uh, International Council for Mining and Metals, which is a, a group of 16 or so leading mining company CEOs who get together, sponsored research on what they call not the resource curse, but the resource endowment, which is a slightly different spin on it. Depends how you look at it. Uh, and to try and look and see what factors uh, led to more positive outcomes and, and what less positive outcomes. And this has been a subject of great interest to me over the last 40 years. And one of the great privileges of moving from country to country living in, I've lived, I think, in 10 different countries uh, and visited operations in another 30 or 40, is actually to look at the impact of these operations and their economic impact and their social impact. And the picture is, as it, in most of the world, mixed. If I take three examples, Malaysia, when I first went to Malaysia, it was a relatively low-income country, dependent on oil, gas, mining, uh, tin, palm oil, uh, and so on. You could tell the occupation of a, a citizen simply by looking at them. You could d d say by looking at people, whether they were Chinese, Indian, or Malay, more or less certainly, or European, more or less certainly what they did, what they their job was. Uh, Forty years later, uh, Malaysia is a modern, light uh, industrial economy uh, with a high income, and you can no longer tell uh, people's occupation simply by looking at them, which is remarkable progress. And oil and gas played a role in that, but a subsidiary role. In Oman, when I first went to Oman in the Middle East, it, it, Oman is a sultanate, uh, the former sultan. It was a, a country which was, frankly, medieval. Uh, if you, much of the population, the, the Bedou population in the desert and in the mountains, many of them suffered from trachoma, that eye disease, uh, which eye infections, which if you look at old photographs of the Middle East, you see are very common. Uh, Female genital mutilation was common. Uh, I think uh, people, the last person had been stoned to death about a few years before. Jail consisted of a ball and chain. Uh, and uh, education was extremely basic. If you look at Oman now, it has a bicameral parliament, uh, an elected lower house. Uh, women are elected to it. Uh, an appointed upper house, that might seem not entirely democratic, but we've got one too, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> engages us in discussions sometimes. Uh, the, so, uh, th and education, they have a, a two universities, uh, they are a poster child for the UN development program, the, the way in which the country has developed. Uh, in terms of education, uh, health care, and, and infant mortality, and all those. I mean, they have a fantastic record. And that is almost entirely based on oil income. If you look at Nigeria, over the same uh, 
40 years, the picture is very mixed. They all started off at about the same place. Malaysia and, and Nigeria were probably slightly ahead. Uh, but the outcome is very different. Uh, Nigeria has uh, continued civil strife, uh, maldistribution of income, uh, and so on. Now, if you look at an oil, has played a very big part in that. Now, if you look at the, the more happy uh, versions and the less happy outcomes, and you take pride in the one, you have to admit responsibility for the other. But then you look at, at what are actually the causes. And in those cases, in each of those cases, the company concerned, the main company concerned in each of those cases, was the same. So if you try and do a scientific ex experiment and hold one variable constant, the company was the same. The people were the same. The company operated to the same principles. It, uh, Nigerians worked in, in Malaysia and in Oman, and Omanis and Malaysians worked in Nigeria. Yet the outcome was very different. And I think uh, at least the majority of the answer is actually in the government. It's nothing to do with the people. It's what government they are blessed with or not blessed with. In Oman, there was a very enlightened sultan, the son of the person who was in charge when I first went there. He overthrew his father, uh, and he's still in charge. Uh, in Malaysia, you had, uh, for 20 of those 40 years, Mahathir Mohamed, uh, who may not be the most popular person, but he is a highly effective leader and has, uh, has a big responsibility, carries a big responsibility for that transformation. I think it is largely down to him. And at times, it looks as though the wheels might come off, but I don't think they will. In Nigeria, for more than half that period, you had an, a military government, uh, a completely non-elected, opportunistic military government. And the motivation of those governments was not necessarily to serve the people, but simply to serve themselves. So if you look at at that process, when I look at it, and I used to think 25 or 30 years ago that if a company operated in a country and did it to reasonable standards, international standards, uh, didn't bribe people, uh, had reasonable staff development programs, community programs, uh, paid its taxes in the country where they were earned, if the government then took that money and misspent it, that was not the responsibility of the company. I'm still not sure about where the responsibility lies, but I certainly know where the problems lie. Because if you operate in a country where the, the, which becomes dysfunctional, your business is dysfunctional. And it's no good saying, when people say, what happened to all that revenue? It's no good saying, we paid the taxes, because if you can't see the effect of the taxes, uh, it's, it's a hopeless argument. You'll never win it. So uh, what to do? I was, when I joined Shell, I joined it at a time as a student where the world uh, was still well aware of United Fruit in Central America, ITT in Africa. And the driving force was to say, large companies should stay out of politics and not try and run countries. And I still believe that strongly. Uh, I also believe they shouldn't make political contributions. Uh, but opinions on that vary depending where you are and which side of the Atlantic you're on. Uh, so action by a single comp country, company, I think, is still uh, misplaced. Sorry, very small watch. Uh, is, is, I think, still misplaced. Even if you do action in groups of companies, inevitably, human nature being what it is, you're going to bend the system in the general interest of, of business. So is there any solution to this? I think in one of the most encouraging things in the last uh, 15 or 20 years has actually been the development of alliances between business, civil society, uh, labor unions, 
particularly to address specific problems. Many of these have been single issue uh, concerns. They started in, in trade, uh, partly through consumer pressure and consumer interest, with strong uh, civil society NGO uh, push, where uh, enlightened companies, constructive companies, sat down and said, you know, what should we do about forestry? So out of that comes a sustainable uh, a forest stewardship council, or something like Unilever and uh, WWF working on sustainable fisheries. So these are uh, alliances of companies and civil society specifically aimed at, at single issues. And they have actually been, had real impact. And if you look at other areas, you can talk about the voluntary principles for security and human rights, which was developed by the human rights civil society movement, uh, governments, the UK government and the State Department in the US, and major mining and oil companies to address a problem of security. You need security, but how do you do it in a, in a proper way? The, or the uh, uh, anti-corruption uh, movements, starting with uh, uh, Soros and uh, Global Witness, Publish What You Pay, and moving then into the, uh, into the uh, uh, wider corruption movement to which uh, most of the extractive companies sign up to. And that which involves developing countries, it actually involves some non-developing countries such as Norway, uh, to change and begin to have an impact. You could talk about the Kimberley process of conflict diamonds uh, and, and so on. So I think this is potentially an extremely effective uh, mechanism. The biggest one of these organizations is actually the United Nations Global Compact, where in uh, 1999, I think, uh, originally, but launched in 2000, the former Secretary General Kofi Annan challenged companies to commit to embed in their day-to-day -day operations the major conventions of the United Nations, uh, expressed in the form of originally nine principles, subsequently ten principles when corruption was added, principles which address human rights, working conditions, the environment, and corruption, and rooted in major UN conventions. And they didn't only have to sign up and say that they thought this was a good idea and that they would try and uh, uh, embed it in their operations, but they also committed to report on it every year in what we call the integrity measures. Uh, and if they don't report on it publicly uh, and recommit themselves to this, uh, they're delisted from the, the system. So we have 7,000 companies right around the world, large companies, small companies, who are reporting. We have actually delisted w uh, over 3,000 companies uh, for inactivity because you cannot afford to have people who simply sign up and say, we'll do it, and then produce absolutely no sign that they're doing anything about it. It's not to say that the 7,000 are perfect. They're far from perfect, but they are progressing. The a, a very important aspect of this uh, global compact are it's actually its local networks. And it's my belief that this is probably one of the most effective mechanisms. If you want, for example, to look at, uh, at human rights issues, they are best looked at on a country-by-country -country basis with companies, both international companies, national companies, big companies, small companies, and civil society. And, uh, and labor organizations uh, as well. Uh, and I think there are clear examples where this is a, a starting process. There are 100 local networks around the world. And they are, I think, beginning to make uh, an impact. And in last week, in 10 days ago in Geneva, we had the annual local networks uh, meeting. 
and uh, it's one of the most exciting meetings I go to. You, you hear stories from all around the world about what these groups with civil society and unions and uh, businesses, national businesses, what they're actually doing. There are networks in China, there are networks in, well, as I said, in 100 uh, countries. The Chinese local network, uh, 10 days ago, no, two weeks ago, had a meeting with its companies specifically to discuss human rights. And that's a delicate issue in China. And as the person who was reporting it uh, to the board in New York said, uh, a few years ago, we could not have done it because the, the term human rights is just too political. But now we can actually talk about it. And the Chinese government supports the, the, uh, the global compact and actually makes a token contribution towards it. So this is a, a, a growing system, I think, and one which I think shows a potential way forward. If you look at... Uh, at how this might uh, apply, it's, it's very difficult sometimes. People find it difficult to, to think of responsible business, and it's extremely important to make sure that business is operating responsibly. But if it's uh, in areas which are sensitive to conflict, which have uh, issues, and almost every country has an issue, these local networks are able to identify the issue and consider what could be done about them. I was, for example, in, uh, in the Gulf area, in, in Dubai, where they have a local network, who have as their main, uh, if I said to them, what are your two biggest issues? The first one, obvious issue, was grossly inefficient use of energy and its consequences. So they're well aware of that, and that's an obvious one for that part of the world. Those of you who've been there will know that energy is used in a fantastically inefficient way. Uh, I go quite a lot to Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia leaves the United States as an energy consumer way behind on a personal, individual basis. Uh, but their second issue, which they raised, was actually working conditions for migrant labor. Uh, and that is something very important. There's very little regulation. Uh, shortly after that, I was in Bangladesh, and I asked them what their two most important issues were. Their first uh, issue that they raised was actually working conditions for migrant labor uh, in, in the Middle East. Uh, they didn't, unfortunately, raise working conditions for Bangladeshis in Bangladesh. Uh, although the, the second uh, issue that they raised was uh, related to employment of disabled people. There was someone there who was very passionate about it and pointed out that if you could employ people who were in disadvantaged in one way or another physically, uh, that it transformed their lives. They became from a complete burden and outcast on the family. They became a, a source of income, but also people who were empowered by this process. So uh, I believe that there is much that can be done by companies working in this way with civil society uh, uh, to improve <laughs> matters. Just finally, I would also raise an, an issue. If you look at uh, what, when, a, when a government is doing something that the rest of the world, or indeed quite a lot of its own population, possibly, uh, including companies working there, are doing, is doing something improper. Uh, it could be in the human rights field, it could be in labor relations, it could be uh, in corruption, could be outright kleptocracy, uh, what can you actually do? And I think this is where these alliances uh, play a role, because it's not just business. It, it's a, it's a, a coalition, as it were. And I believe that if one has in these difficult countries, if you take uh, 
for example, Myanmar, Burma. Uh, over the years, or Sudan, over the years, there has actually been a shift. In Sudan, talisman who were working there were by their shareholders and by uh, human rights organizations and to some extent by the Canadian government <laughs> encouraged to divest their operations, which they did. The operations were taken over by various other countries, including the Chinese state oil company, CNPC, the Malaysian state oil company, uh, and the Indian state oil company. And some years later, I was in a uh, human rights meeting in, in Geneva, where a representative of Talisman asked the assembled company whether anyone had done any work to see whether the withdrawal of Tal Talisman had improved the situation or not. He said he wasn't expressing an opinion, but he'd like to know whether any work had been done. And the answer was no, it hadn't been done. Informally, the answer I got was that it certainly hadn't improved the situation. And I think that has led to a, a change in attitude, a realization that actually having a company, and I think Talisman <coughs> was a very responsible company, they were not perfect, they had some unpleasant security incidents involving the government uh, security before the... Uh, uh, the voluntary principles on security and human rights, which might have saved them and us in Shell quite some trouble. Uh, they had, uh, the situation really had, had not improved, but I think the general attitude in the world has changed and there is now much more support. So Total in Burma, although there was a lot of opposition, in fact, at the time of the typhoon and so on, there was considerable support, I think, for Total remaining there. And there you see a split in the world's approach. We in the West said Burma is a nasty place. Uh, we will put sanctions on it. We will prevent any uh, interaction. The Eastern countries in ASEAN said we will tell Burma when we think that we don't <coughs> agree with them, but we will keep trading and doing business. If you look at the change that happened in Burma, I do not believe it happened due to sanctions. I believe it happened partly, partly due to the continued dialogue between the other ASEAN countries and uh, Burma. I believe personally, and this is extremely difficult to, to prove, that had we had another approach to Iran, and not for the last 20 years or so had Iran under sanctions, largely from the United States, but also supported by others. I think had we had an open trade system, and I did a lot of work with the Iranians, and every time we were stopped by sanctions, the technocrats and the uh, more rational end lost ground, and the wild fellows gained ground because they said, you see, you can't trust these guys. It's impossible to prove, but it's my belief that if we had a different approach, we would have had now a less unpleasant regime in Iran. It, as I say, I can't prove it. I also believe, and this may be even more contentious, that had we not done exactly the same thing with, in Syria, whose present regime is clearly appalling and should be removed, although nobody's willing to remove it. Uh, had we had a different approach to Syria, we would have had a different outcome. The private sector, the economic sector, uh, would not have been purely concentrated in the hands of the government and the friends of the government, as it is in Iran and as it is in Syria, but it would have been more widely spread and there would have been more rational voices with some economic power arguing uh, for change. Not to say that you would get rapid change, not to say that you would il eliminate uh, uh, abuses uh, immediately, but I think you would get change. So with that, I think I'd like to stop and leave it to you.
can I just ask one question to, to, to start? Is in your long experience of dealing with behaviour change uh, with large corporations and their social responsibilities, is there any one thing you think that's been persistently resistant to change and still needs to be dealt with? It, if I, yeah, that's a, a difficult question. If you look at, at the, the progress with the uh, four principal areas in, in the UN Global Compact. Environment was the first that, that people could see that, get that quite easily. Labor uh, working conditions, they get that. That's, both of those, in a sense, are normal business. Anti-corruption came later and is a difficult area, but, but people get that. Human rights is the most difficult one. And until the work that uh, Professor John Ruggie did, uh, developing the uh, uh, UN framework on, on uh, human rights and business and human rights, I think there was a, a considerable blurring of that area. If you, talked, if you said to most businesses, what about human rights? The bell went off, this is about arresting people, torturing people, we don't do that, so it's, we're not interested. It's nothing to do with us. I think what uh, John Ruggie did was to make, to, in setting up the principles, set them out quite clearly, uh, this approach whereby the responsibility of the government uh, to protect is absolutely clear, which made the business people very happy. They said, at last, someone has said it's their job, not ours. But then the second leg of that is to say, it's business's right to respect. And the third leg is remedy. Yeah. Uh, and that helped, and because he did it with enormous consultation with both civil, so it's a terrific piece of work, really very good indeed. So I, th I think human rights has been the slowest. Yeah because okay. of misunderstandings. Yeah. Okay, so the field is open to any questions. Mary. Hello, uh, my name is Mary Harder. I'm a professor here at the University of Brighton, but I'm currently spending nine months a year in China. Um, I'm very interested about you talk, what you talk, uh, spoke about civil society doing so many different things around the world. Um, I was involved a bit with uh, the, the United Nations Regional Centers of Expertise for uh, Education for Sustainable Development, and I went to a couple of their annual meetings. And what I found quite remarkable was groups of people who had come together locally, say in South Korea or Pune or um, Northampton, uh, turning up at an international conference and they were there talking as a group of businesses, educators, um, local organizations, civil society, city to city or to across, across countries to each other as different groups. And they exchanged so much information and learned so much about what to do when they went back to the country that you really began to wonder why do we need governments? And so I wondered if you would just uh, expand on this a little bit. If, if civil society is so rich for some of the solutions and some of the impetus that you say is really needed, really should we be thinking about governments looking a bit more like civil society or civil society looking a bit more like uh, governments? And of course, this is a really big question in Rio plus 20 at the moment about uh, where governance that for the environment is the case they're making, but for sustainable development generally, where should it lie, at what well. level? Well, I, I am a, a very strong believer in the role of governments. I think we need governments. And I always say, if you lived in a country without a government, or effectively without a government, or visited countries uh, without a government, you'd have to invent them, basically. Uh, because you need someone. You need regulation. Uh, you need uh, the, the uh, things I've been talking about are voluntary. But they are also quasi-mandatory because they get baked in and supported by different groups. So they become uh, an acceptable way forward. Uh, but in the end, you need regulation. And you need to, to, to have regulation with teeth and uh, the full force of the law. And only governments can do that. Then the question is, uh, otherwise you have all sorts of uh, you know, militia and so on. Uh, the, the question is then the, the legitimacy of the government. 
But I do think that the input from people often ask me, what do I think is the is what should business schools be be teaching, uh, and that they're not teaching, and I always say the the absolute essential is to teach people to listen to people who they don't agree with, uh, who they may think are stupid uh, and ill-informed, because if you sit down and genuinely listen, you do actually learn a great deal, and it, it's a kind of radar of interacting and, and in general business is companies are some companies are getting much better at it but we have not been good at it and uh, I personally learnt it uh, through quite bitter lessons in the, the 90s the importance of actually listening and engaging to people and in Shell we took that up as a kind of policy I was in Sudan talking to the boss of the Chinese state company with uh, Judy, my wife, and uh, he was incensed because uh, he said, they're complaining about the quality of our water, the emitted water. And he said, it's, it's, it's very good. And they complain about security. And we don't have a problem there. He, was, he said, I mean, he was feeling thoroughly misunderstood. And, and very frustrated. And Judy said to him, uh, you remind me of my husband 20 years ago, because he sounded just like that. Uh, so I, I, I think it's a question, I mean, I think the, the value is in the, uh, in, in the, in the input. Yes, uh, Phil Ashworth, who's a professor of geography here at the university. And uh, I was wondering whether there's a, a conflict of interest with businesses acting responsibly. Uh, basically, they are responsible to their shareholders, and uh, businesses' job, you could argue, is about maximizing profits. So, for example, BP, you might argue, is a, and it may well be part of your verbal compact group, is it? It is. It is. Yet, they very aggressively beat down the settlement for the Gulf oil spill and very successfully saving millions of dollars for their shareholders. And I just wonder whether you, how you think uh, that conflict of interest, where that lies with big business. Should they be responsible to their shareholders? Are they sh responsible to shareholders? And the rest is just make up. No, I think, I, I think you have to look at, at what the fundamental of business is. The fundamental of business is to supply goods or services to that society either needs or wants and that's the the and in order to do that it has to make a profit so the profit element is essential so when we talk about the sort of three strands of sustainability economic social and and environmental uh, NGOs always say to me yeah but with business, the economics are always most important. And I say, well, it's actually the most important with you guys as well. As soon as you lose your source of income, conversation on everything stops, and not-for-profits focus on how they can survive economically. And that's true whether you're a church, or a labor union, or whatever. So we do need an economic strand, and it, it's important. The question is whether it overrides everything else, and whether you take a shorter term view or a longer term view. Uh, in the old Shell business principles and the current ones, uh, it says that our responsibility to our shareholders is to protect the value of their investment, which is very important, and that has a long term element, and to deliver an acceptable rate of return or a competitive rate of return. It's not to maximize it. And people often say, you have a legal responsibility to maximize it. It's not true. I mean, I have operated under a flag of saying an acceptable rate of return, not the maximum, for the last umpteen years. Uh, so I, I, I don't know whether that answers it at all. Incidentally, I think BP are quite right to try and beat down the settlements because there are a lot of scammy claims in that. <laughs> and, and that's what you, happens when you get lawyers involved. 
three more questions now queuing up. There's one here, one over there, and I think one up the back. Four. Who are you going to pass, John? Okay. John Harley, um, uh, in the past life, as you know me, Mark, with Ernst & Young as a partner and now uh, on the board of the University of Brighton, so very happy to be involved. Um, I mean, the thing to me from business is this change in corporate social responsibility and the fact that to some extent it's about the check. What money are we going to pay to charities? What money are we going to do to uh, non-governmental uh, organizations? Corporate social responsibility comes at a cost. And I think the people I've seen have done, uh, done it the best also see the benefit. What would you say is a kind of trigger point and what, how do shareholders respond to that as well? Well, I, I mean, I would start off by, by excluding. Uh, I mean, when you talk about what do you pay to someone, that, in my opinion, is philanthropy. And that's what The Economist, in a rather critical article of corporate social responsibility, called uh, borrowed virtue. You're using the shareholders' money to buy your reputation. And if the shareholders want that done, they can do it themselves. Uh, so I, I believe you need a, a certain amount of local corporate, uh, as a corporate citizen. You know, if the local hospital needs help, then I think there is an, an argument for local <laughs> philanthropy. But the main bit is actually what you do in your own business and how you do it. If you look at any of these uh, uh, major oil or mining companies, if you take, they, you know, they might have in things that they categorize as social responsibility, uh, they might spend $50 million or $100 million. But in their main business in developing countries, they are investing 15 or $20 billion, and that's what actually makes the difference. It's, it's, it's how you do that and what the impact of that is on the whole economic chain. So the impact of an Anglo-American, uh, I was chairman of Anglo-American, if you go in their report, they show you what happens to the, what the distribution, what goes to shareholders, what goes to banks, what goes to employees, <laughs> what goes in taxes, and where. And then you see that, that if you take the employees bit, and then there's tax on the employees, which also goes to government. And then the employees spend their money, and that goes straight into the local economy. You find that the impact of a mining company on a developing country, because much of this is done, is actually very significant. And it's how you do that, rather than you know, giving, certainly giving something to the, an opera house or whatever. OK, there's another. Uh, question over here. Uh, Edward Smith, I'm a student here at Brighton. Um, I was just, I've looked through the notes and it's, it seems like a lot of the time that it's, it's an enlightened board on the top of a company or an enlightened sultan and they seem to be single entities or people that work and I was wondering if you think in your experience that it's a matter of faith that there will be enough people like that to make the world generally better or if it's a matter of time. And also with the time issue, where does social responsibility stop for those companies? Because a lot of countries would consider internet access a human right now. So where does that stop? Do you get a car, a telly, a house from them? I was just sort of curious as to what your opinion on that would be. No, the, 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 uh, I mean, it's a very good question. Where does, I, I mean, whether this is, is driven purely by enlightened people or you know, and, and do we have enough enlightened people? And I think the answer is a, a, a mixture. If people see a company apply, if, if you take, if, if you look at Unilever, I mean, Unilever, I think, is actually doing, and Paul Polman, who's the boss of Unilever, I have a great respect for. Uh, they are doing a remarkable job, I think. And if you look at the, the effort they are putting into what's an what's a, an extremely difficult area. If we're going to feed the world, we will have to transform agriculture. If you transform agriculture, uh, you will have disturbances in, in 
country folk, as it were. Their, their lives will change, as they were in this country, and as they have been in every country, and as is happening in, in China. The question is, uh, how do you keep the people empowered and still benefit, but you, it's a bad word, how do you industrialize the process? Because unless you have processing facilities, transportation to market and so on, these people are going to s be stuck in subsistence agriculture and grinding poverty and continually need injections of aid. So the, the, the social, the corporate responsibility comes from addressing those kind of problems and what do we do about water. I would say leave the internet access. I leave the internet access to, to individual peoples having enough money to decide what they want to and to those companies who are actually whose main business it is, the, the IT companies, because it's only any good working in responsibility in areas which you actually know something about and which touches your business. And this can go quite far. It can go, in, it goes into health, it can go into education, but it's education. Why are you interested in education? Because you need educated scientific people to work in the, so in a recent survey in the Global Compact, surprisingly education in its widest form was one of the major concerns of business. Now, if I, I know, I can guess, that what they were really talking about is having the people educated in the areas that they really need. And they're very worried about it because they think that, that we're going to have lots of folk from India and China and no scientists and engineers or inadequate quantities of scientists and engineers in this country, and the rest of Europe and in the United States. But you do need, uh, you, you need leadership at the top, but you also need nationally legislation because there will always be people who don't want to do it and who free ride and every country, you know, even in the United States where they hate regulation, you say, have you got building regulations? They say, yes, of course. Why do you have bu building regulation? Stop cowboy builders, you know. I mean, the cowboy builders don't just happen in funny countries. They exist everywhere. Okay, we have two more questions. There's one up here on the left, and then Alan in the middle. All right, thank you very much. My name is Raj Dean. I'm from the business school here in Brighton. Um, my question is based on your presentation. I am from Nigeria, luckily. And um, one of the pro I think the major problem we have in Nigeria is um, corruption. And um, ever since I was born, I've been hearing, and I stick here till today, that Nigeria is a developing country. Up to now, it's still developing, and it's yet to develop, which is due to corruption. Now, my question is, what is the United Nations doing to address this corruption by the government? One. Then secondly, Looking at the corruption rate in the country, um, the multinational companies or the non-governmental um, organizations, now because of the corruption rate, they are, it has so spread to the extent that majority of them are now corrupt. Now the social responsibilities that should be done or that should be effectively carried out on the society is not being done. All they do is just to buy their way by bribery. And as a result, nothing is done in the country. So what is the United Nations or the civil society doing to address this particular problem? Well, uh, I think you're right about the fact that corruption is a major uh, problem. It's fueled at the moment by bunkering, as you know. I mean, if, if at the minister, bunkering is, is theft of oil from pipelines into barges and into tankers and into the Rotterdam market. At the estimate of the finance minister, I think, estimated it's 400,000 barrels a day. Shell reckons it's 150 plus. But if you take that and assume heavy discount, I mean, this is billions of dollars a year. Why can't you stop it? Why can you not stop it? You know, these barges go offshore. They could be stopped by the Navy. There are clearly. Uh, forces at work preventing it being uh, stopped. Uh, you say that the, 
I mean, I would argue as to whether all the companies are corrupt. Uh, in all my time in Nigeria, we did not pay bribes to anyone. We would have the work held up. We went to enormous efforts to not pay bribes. But nonetheless, it's endemic in the, in the country. I think a, a really encouraging uh, thing is, is the, the issue I mentioned, or the organization I mentioned, which is the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. Uh, and this requires, it, it uh, originated with civil society, Global Witness and Soros, as publish what you pay. The idea being that if the oil extractive companies published what they paid to the government, at least people would know what was going there. I always said to them, this is step 1A. Uh, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative was set up uh, with a system whereby if a country signs up to the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, and there are now 30-something of them, including Nigeria, uh, the, all the payments from extractive companies to government at whatever level are audited and the receipt by those payments by the government are audited independently and the two are matched to make sure there's no leakage. A very important part of the process, and this is a bit addresses the question of the role of civil society, is that, that as part of the accession process to become a complying country, you have to establish an independent panel of civil society, some business people, to oversee the process and call foul if it goes wrong. The very act of, is in many countries, if you take Kazakhstan or somewhere like that, again, uh, uh, issues of corruption, of being able to establish and make sure that the, this independent panel can genuinely function, can genuinely criticize the government and the president without consequences, is already, never mind the corruption, a huge step forward, and which is the input of civil society. The worry then is, uh, and that's why Norway subscribed to it, because Norway said, we have, we don't think we actually need the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative because we have democratic oversight of the process. What happens to the oil funds in, in Norway? But they said, we're going to do it because we want to see how this civil society supervision can be meshed onto what we regard as a proper democracy and not somehow be considered as an alternative form or light democracy. Uh, so in other words, that you don't suddenly begin to think that, that civil society and multi-stakeholder panels replace government, because they don't. Uh, so I think, I mean, the picture is mixed in Nigeria. I think there are people trying extremely hard to do something about it. Uh, but it's, it's a huge problem, because if you face billions of dollars of corrupt money, it's, it's mighty easy to distort the process. I watched the process uh, some years ago in Brazil where the government was genuinely trying to shut down uh, an operation which the major oil companies considered cost the government $2 billion a year in revenue. And it took something like two or three years. Not because the government was slow, but because they had a democratic process. So when a, a, a judge dismissed for no reason, apparent reason at all, a case against one of these things, they had to go through a process of removing the judge. You can't just fire the judge, because we can't do that. You have to have a system for properly removing a, a So it takes uh, time. Uh, I'm, I'm not unoptimistic about, about Nigeria. I would be more optimistic if, if a proper solution could be found to this bunkering issue. And I think the, the answer will lie in a, some kind of co... It's a bit like 
blood diamonds, uh, conflict diamonds. We could have a coalition of major oil traders, because in the end the oil is traded, uh, and uh, the producing companies and the government uh, and other governments. I think we might make some progress in shutting it down, but it's very difficult to shut down an I illegal activity which generates billions of dollars. Before we move to the next question, is there any observation you would like to make in response to Sir Mark's answer? Okay, thank you. Alan. Thank you very much. It's Alan Tomlinson. I'm Professor of Leisure Studies at the University of Brighton. Uh, I, I just wondered, Sir Mark, whether you've ever encountered on this theme of corruption, whether you've encountered people not directly in, in line with you in your business transaction, but who, who may be provenly corrupt from another sphere, uh, such as, say, FIFA or the International Olympic Committee, and whether that would have presented you with a moral dilemma. No, I, th I, uh, I, I often say that I've kept a list of people I have met in my business dealings or come across, perhaps not actually met them, but been very well aware of their activity, who I think should be in jail. I have a, a rather shorter list of those who actually went to jail. Uh, an example would be the former president, director general of, of the oil company, Elf. Uh, I knew that Elf paid money. Uh, he uh, did it, in my opinion, uh, encouraged by the Mitterrand government to governments in Francophone Africa. Uh, unfortunately, in, and I had a particular encounter with him, uh, which caused me to have a, a very uh, stressful evening. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I was actually at a, an opera sponsored by Elf uh, <laughs> the, uh, in The Hague. In the end, uh, he went to jail, uh, which was a good thing and actually improved the French jail system because he was very well connected. Uh, so the, the, <laughs> there are people, uh, I mean, there are demonstrable cases. Uh, you know, you don't just have to look at Bernie Madoff. There are cases. There, there were cases in Italy where people in the in the industry uh, regrettably committed suicide. But at, I think at the the heart of some of these issues were corruption in investigation. So there is no doubt that it ha and and uh, the 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 dilemma of corrupt it's uh, corruption is. Well, we could spend the whole evening on the subject. There's, people always look at outgoing corruption. There is also incoming corruption. Our biggest battles in share, if you want to stop out, if you, if you don't want your company to pay bribes, if you have decent accounting controls, uh, you, can, you, don't have, you can stop it. You may not be able to prevent some enthusiasts somewhere doing something small, but in general, you can stop it. So, so when the board of Siemens, the top of Siemens, say, we had no idea that there was a billion and a half euros or more paid in bribes over a, a series of years. Either they're not very good at running a business, that they could lose this money somehow, or else they're not telling the truth. <laughs> uh, and Siemens is a reformed company, and, and they have impeccable approaches to corruption at the moment. BAAE Systems is also, uh, uh, I mean, if, if, if you, uh, many of these things do not come as a surprise. Anybody who operated in the Middle East would know the corruption in the aircraft and arms industry and know who it went to. Uh, and they would know the difficulties the government would have uh, when it addressed this issue and what international ructions it would call, cause. And in my opinion, the best approach in those uh, things is to say, may not be justice, let's put the past on one side and now let's sort out the future. Because sorting out the past can be very difficult. Okay, we're coming close to the end of time, but if you
if you're still willing, with there's, yeah, there's no, two no, more no, questions. Happy, there's you know. one here, and then in the row behind. For you first. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jade. I'm a student here at the university, and I'm really uh, interested in what, well, when you mentioned behavioral change and engaging in constant dialogue. But before I ask my question, I I thought I should let you know I, I grew up in the Philippines in a community that was greatly and positively impacted by Shell Philippines, which is why I ended up working with them as an intern when they decided to um, increase the oil price, and in retaliation, a group of Filipinos decided to take machine guns and just like shoot, well, at people in, <laughs> in our office. So um, I'm really quite curious, in cases like that, when there are polar opposites, and you have, I guess, people with irreconcilable differences, shall we say, how do you ensure, how do you constantly, how can you um, engage them in, in dialogue and conversation? Because it's quite differ difficult, I think, to reach a consensus if the other party thinks you should be dead. <laughs> yes, uh, the, I, I mean there are clearly there are clearly cases, and, and, and this goes back a bit to the voluntary principles for security and human rights, because the human rights organisations said we understand that you may need security to protect the lives of your people. We also understand if there are a lot of arms around, you may need armed security, otherwise it won't do any good. Uh, the question is. How do you make sure that those armed securities uh, behave properly? And if by any chance they come from the government, and government security forces very often have poor records of human rights, can you be sure that the government, is, the government forces are somehow constrained or trained? So, so people spend a lot of time training. So in Colombia and so on, thousands of security people have been trained by the resource industry. Uh, they, the, there's clearly times when the risk is simply too high and you should say, okay, I, I, this is a situation of strife and, and I'm not going to go there. In, in our case, in, in Algeria, in Shell's case in Algeria, there was a period when the FIS, the uh, Islamic movement, uh, this would have been in the 90s, uh, were uh, close to winning an election and then they were, the election was cancelled. Uh, we in the West supported the cancellation, regrettably because we thought the wrong people would win. I think that's very difficult when, we, when someone has an election and there, there is actually popular support. The only <laughs> argument for cancelling it is if, uh, if you believe that the people are fundamentally non-democratic, I suppose. But the feast said and demonstrated that they were very good at killing foreigners. And at that point, we said, don't send anyone there. Because, because not only have they said they're going to do it, but they actually have demonstrated that they're quite good at it. Uh, and I think it would be very difficult from a human and conscious point of view to, to send someone there, uh, even if they were said they were happy to go. Uh, so there are clearly kind of red lines. But very often, if you sit down and, and talk to people, and that again is where civil, if you can have a, a, a trusted interlocutor, somebody who actually can talk to them, and who, who is also trusted by the, the company, and can bring the parties together, uh, surprisingly, sometimes you can make uh, progress. Uh, as we see in international negotiations, not always. Which is, I go back to my point, I believe in business engagement. One of the things about business uh, is that there is a kind of common language. I mean, if you, if you talk to Iranian business people and American business people, they actually speak more or less the same language. They may be completely different cultural <laughs> backgrounds, but they understand what's needed. And I think that helps to build bridges. Unfortunately, not everyone agrees. <laughs> I was just quite interested to know, my name's Raphael, I'm a, I'm a student here. I was quite interested to know what you thought about the comments made by the CEO of Nestle, who uh, commented that he didn't believe, no, it wasn't that he didn't believe, he didn't consider that water was a human right, a basic human right. I can't 
help but considers some strange parallels about getting people clean water and our ability to deliver oil, you know, exponentially, really. I wondered what you thought. I, I, I didn't hear the... the do, you, do, you, do you know who, who it was? No, yes. The, 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 I mean, the, the previous one was someone called Brahma Klamath. And he, he, I actually had quite a respect for him, but he did say some fairly uh, slightly controversial things. Uh, I, I mean, Nestle uh, do a great deal of work on water. So it may, I don't know, it, uh, I wonder how he... <laughs> no, I, th I uh, who knows? It, I think it, it hinges around the probably, and I'm guessing, not having seen what he said, I would guess it hinges around uh, this question of what is a human right? Uh, and it's a bit the question we had on, on uh, uh, you know, access to the internet, uh, you know, being nearly a human right. Now, clearly you have to stop at, at some point and, and if you say it's a human right, whose responsibility is it to develop, uh, to, to deliver the right, as it were? So it may have been, I don't know, uh, not have. Don't you think that the profit motive undermines that kind of development? Otherwise, everybody would have food, clean drinking water. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. Well, actually, I, uh, I think in many cases, one of the great tragedies of the. Uh, of the water industry was when there were ill-managed privatizations. So the investment needed in water, which is not available from governments, which can be made by private companies, but they do need a profit. But you can, through regulation, control and specify that there has to be access where the access is. One of the tragedies is that the halting of this process means that smaller private sector, you get water distribution in carts and sale of water at astronomical prices, which is, in my opinion, unacceptable. So I don't accept that the profit motive prevents the proper distribution of goods in regulated industries. The example oft quoted is, you know, would you have rather would you rather fly on British Airways or Aeroflot? You know, there's, there's, you can run a perfectly good uh, commercial organisation uh, without cutting corners on maintenance because it would destroy the airline if they have crashes due to. No, oh, absolutely. There was. And, and the company concerned was Shell. And that's the, the alien. No, and the reason. No, but, but the reason the Supreme Court of the United States kicked it out was they said there has been. I have to be very cautious about trying to quote the Supreme Court. But they said that none of the people involved have any connection uh, with the United States, with the operation, which was an operation in Nigeria. There is no, no connection between the two. And therefore, are we in the United States, you know, sue Shell somewhere else, sue them in the Netherlands, where, where Shell is headquartered. That's happening, and that's fine. And Shell was sued in the United Nations and won the case. On that note, we, we've, we've, had a, we've had the hour that we put aside a little bit more. Um, and before I draw it to a close, can I, can I first of all thank Professor Phil Ashworth and Professor Alan Tomlinson for organising these events, and to Hugh and all his colleagues for making the arrangements for this evening. 
but especially Sir Mark, it's, it's a real privilege for us that in your busy schedule you've given us an hour tonight and put the time aside. And we were, de we were delighted when we heard you were willing to do it. And I think to have the opportunity to listen to somebody with your wealth of experience and be willing to be candid and honest in giving us your views and your opinions has been a real privilege. And I hope if the situation arises again that we can invite you back, I hope you would feel good enough and warm enough to return. So can I ask everybody to show your appreciation to them.